to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why in how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me your ears. And if you're watching us on YouTube at the Sales Influence channel, I appreciate your eyeballs as well. So today, I got something out of left field. I got KD. No, not Kevin Durant. That would be good, but not him. I got Kevin Dorsey on the Sales Influence Podcast. Kevin, how you doing today, man? Dude, I'm, I'm loving life. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm feeling your energy, man. Let's do this. Yeah, so I, I, I here's the backstory as to why I and Kevin are connecting right now. So Kevin did a post. Actually, by the way, I actually just like literally had to screenshot this post because it was too funny. So your post was titled Sales Fails, right? And as I'm reading your post, and I'm just like cracking up inside because I've seen all the mistakes you've made, and I'm going, oh, yeah, I kind of just kind of like that. Yeah, my, you know, it was almost like a checklist, right? And I started laughing. And then I started reading some of your other posts. And you know, I, I, I came across with the impression that I said, I like this guy. He's, you know, he's, you're knowledgeable, you know who, you, about sales, but you're also not pretentious, man. I think that's what I, that's what I really loved about your post, man. But let the folks know who you are, Kevin, before we jump into this. For sure. So I'm, I'm Kevin Dorsey. Everyone calls me KD. The only people that call me Kevin are my, my wife and my mom, and both times I'm probably in trouble. Um, I'm, a, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, um, I'm a, a salesperson, a sales leader, and I'm passionate about it, man. Like, it's not, sales is one of the greatest careers you can have, and I love my salespeople, and so I try to give back as much as I possibly can. So I'm the VP of Inside Sales at a company called Patient Pop in Santa Monica. I lead a team of almost 100 there now, and we'll con- be continuing to grow over the next year or so. And um, yeah, man, that's, that's who I am. That's it. I love that, man. So, so tell me, you know, I mean, we're, we're going through a lot of changes now in sales. Just give me the high level stuff. What are you seeing in sales today? You know, what's changing? What's happening? Man, it's, there's a lot changing. And then there's also just a lot of things that are staying the same and salespeople aren't changing, you know? Mm-hmm. And so if we look at, obviously buyers have access to more information now than they used to. Um, but also salespeople do too. We just don't leverage it. Buyers have information on us. We have information on buyers. We just don't leverage it. So the buyer's desire to deal with salespeople are way less. I think they just released a study that said like 60 some percent of buyers would rather not deal with a salesperson in the sales process. Like, okay, like we need to adjust to that. So I think in a lot of ways, man, sales, sales kills sales. Once one thing starts to work, Everyone goes out and does it at 60, 70%. And then it makes that not work anymore, right? Email is harder. Cold calling is harder. Social selling is harder. Video is harder. Face-to-face obviously is harder. We're in this pandemic. Like every channel is getting hit right now. And as salespeople, we need to adapt. We need to improve. We got to be better. We can't just grit our way through it anymore. And that's something that I think people need to pay attention to. What, what, do, what do you mean by sales kill sales? I, I don't think I've ever heard that phrase, man. Yeah. So like salespeople will do things that make it harder on future salespeople, right? Mm-hmm. And so, for example, let's talk about like email automation is a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, when it first came out, right, go back to the mm-hmm. predictable revenue days, Aaron Ross, like, oh, wow, like you can send an email and get introduced to the person that makes the decision. All of a sudden, everyone goes out and does it mm-hmm. haphazardly. They don't do it with intention. Yeah. And then everyone stops responding to it, right? Lo- local yeah. dialer, right? Remember when local dial came out? Like all of a sudden, <laughs> like your phone could show up like a local number. It was the greatest thing ever. I still remember the first day I was making cold calls with local dials. <laughs> Got like 15 people to answer the phone. I was like, this is amazing. Magic. It's magic. <laughs> a year and a half later, now what happens when you see a local number that you don't know? You don't answer it. And right. so this is what I mean by like sales kill sales. Is we do things without intention. We do things sometimes at a lower quality level than that makes it harder for all salespeople because then we all get lumped into one bucket, right? If you ask most people mm. how they feel about salespeople, what's their response? Don't like them. Don't want to talk to like them. them. Right? Why not? Well, they're shady. They're sleazy. They're pushy. Are all salespeople that way? No, they're not. But the ones we remember are... And so then the entire bucket of salespeople gets put into that and it makes it harder on each other. It's, it's, it sucks, man. It really does. Yeah. You used the word twice already intention. That's the word you keep using intention and, and talk to me about that. You know, dig, dig a little deep on that one, because just like you, I get these like LinkedIn requests, right? 
And there's no, like, there's no honeymoon. There's no foreplay. There's just like, let's get to it. And I'm like, whoa, I don't even know you that well. Talk to me about intention and what people are doing out there that, that it is wrong. It's, it's just slowing down and being purposeful for what are you actually trying to achieve? Like if you actually, that's what I mean by intention, right? And you said it earlier, why people buy, right? Why people buy? Well, why people make any decision is emotionally. We make all decisions emotionally. We justify it with logic. Are you being intentional about the emotion you're trying to create in the person that you're reaching out to? So you said that LinkedIn message. If the person had paused for just five seconds and said, what emotion am I trying to get from Victor in this message? That's what I mean by intention. What everyone tries to do in, in right now, all salespeople focus on are the results. They're trying to get a meeting with Victor. They want to get a conversation with Victor. No, like you have to think, okay, what's the emotion that would trigger the curiosity to get the response to then get the meeting? So how does, people, Katie, can I ask you a question? I don't mean to interrupt, but, I, but this is like, you're going down a good rabbit hole here. It's like, how do we get, how do we rehabilitate salespeople? You know what I mean? How do you rehabilitate salespeople who who fall into this, you know, the, the the no foreplay type of mindset? You know, how do you, you know, you're managing 100 people. How do you rehabilitate some of those people in your organizations? Man, it starts with me going through therapy. You follow me, right? Like this is this has been my own journey as a sales leader cuz like you can't blame the team for skipping the foreplay when the leader is doing the exact same Thing, right and then it, this goes all the way up right because then who am i reporting to right oh well, i'm reporting the ceo who are they reporting to the board and the investors that cut a hundred million dollar check right and so it's it's a it's systemic right most leaders don't lead with intention most leaders don't pay attention to the person most leaders don't think about or even talk about the emotional side of selling right what do they just say more 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 dials more demos more revenue knock on more like no, like that, that's what I mean is like intention starts at the top. And if you're not intentional with what you're asking your people to do, if you're not intentional, like even what you said, man, why people buy, you know how many salespeople don't even know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And by sales, yeah. you also mean sales leaders. They don't, why do people buy? Oh, for ROI. Re really? Mm -hmm. That's, that's why people buy is for ROI. Like, so right. it starts with leaders, man. Like, and I, I'll be the first one to say I've grown here. I wasn't, oh, I didn't always lead that or this way now, like it was like, Hey, like we gotta do more. We gotta do more. Like go hit the number. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't hit a number, right? You can only have. So, so what happened to you, KD? What, what happened to you that made you more intentional? You know, what were some of the, you know, moments that happened along the way that made you go, you know what? I need to reevaluate this. I mean, I think it's, it's just taking the second to pause and saying, is it actually working? Like, is it, am I getting the results that I want? Yes or no. And if I'm not, something has to change. And I can't remember, I've been, actually I've been trying to find this now for a couple of years because I read, the, it, read this in a book and I can't remember what book it is. And it bothers me because I wanna recommend it to people. But what it talked about was when making decisions or trying to solve a problem, you, know, you gotta ask yourself, well, why is something the way that it is? And then you have to throw out your first two answers. Because if you ask a lot of sales leaders, like either why their team isn't hitting a number, almost, almost always their first two answers are something around effort or work ethic or focus or activity, right? Well, if you throw those out and you say, okay, well, all right, it's not effort and it's not confidence. Well, why else wouldn't they do this? And then you start getting into, okay, well, why would someone not pick up the phone? I want my team to make more cold calls. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't someone pick up the phone? Well, they don't know how. Okay, maybe that, maybe I gotta teach them better. They're mm -hmm. afraid. What are they afraid of? Why are they afraid? Right now you start getting into like the emotion side of like why people don't do things, right? So I think that was a big shift for, for me where I was hitting numbers, but I didn't feel good and my team didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And then you start to watch them go the wrong direction. Like they almost can't muster up enough to keep it going. And so I was starting to ask those sorts of questions of like, well, why am I not getting the results that I want? And then going down that. that path. I, there's a book called uh, Switch. 
and I'll give you the analogy this in there. It's a good book by the Heath brothers, Dan and uh, Chip Heath. And in there, he talked about the rider, the rational side, on top of the elephant. I don't know if you remember. Have you read the book, by the way? Yeah, yes, I have. Very good. Okay, so you remember, remember the rational rider and the emotional elephant, right? They have to mm -hmm. be in sync. But even if they're in sync, you still have to, they use the phrase, shape the path, which is to show them. And, and you pointed it out already, right? Because they, they know they need to pick up the phone rationally. They go, I need to pick up the phone and make this successful. And mostly, I can get over my fear, but how do I do it? And I think that's where sales leaders come in to kind of help them. I think shaping the path is big. You know, do you find that with your team that you almost have to kind of, I don't want to say blueprint it out for them, but kind of, and I hate to use the word playbook because it's, it's been so overused. It's, 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 it's nauseating, right? Uh, but how do you help them over those humps? How do you mentally help somebody who has sales call reluctance, for example? Mm -hmm. So it's funny, man. I just gave a one hour presentation yesterday on how to build a real sales playbook, like mm. a real sales playbook. And you know what the first <laughs> session of a playbook is? Your people. Everyone skips the people part in the playbook. They just go right to the product, and it is. Most of them are complete garbage. No one looks at them and they don't work, but the, the people side, right? So I am a very process-based leader. Like, here's what works the majority of the time. Let's coach to that. Let's teach to that. Let's get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of repetitions in, right? Like another part of my journey as a leader, um, this was about three years ago now, I really got into the science of learning. How do we learn as human beings? Because again, back to the questions I ask myself, I was like, God damn it, like, why won't they do it? Like, why won't they? Okay? I had that same frustration. Why? Oh, why won't every, they do it? No, they didn't do every, it. Every sales leader listening right now, can <laughs> their fists are clenched too. They're like, I know, Katie, like, why won't they? It's like, okay, well, they have been taught. All right, I've taught them. It is documented. Here's the, the script. We talk about it often. There it is, yet they still don't do it. Why not? Oh, because they're lazy, because of this. Okay, whatever, you throw those answers out and go, okay, well, if they've been taught and we talk about it often, why will they still not do it? Well, either it's a belief or it's a retention and recall. And this is where we miss in teaching is to teach someone, they actually have to be able to recall it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they didn't actually learn it. We were never taught how to learn. We were taught how to take tests. Mm -hmm. We were never taught how to learn, right? We learned how to take a test, remember something long enough to take that test, and then we never remember it again. Mm -hmm. We can't recall it. And so I started reading a lot on learning. And mm -hmm. what as salespeople and as sales leaders that we miss on is how much repetition it takes to actually learn something. And where do we, like, I said this on stage a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, I don't know about you. Like, obviously you do a lot of speaking. Like I get on stage, I have no idea what I say, right? I black out while I'm up there, then I get off and then people tell me what, what I say. You were awesome. And, you were right, right, and I'm like, someone came, I was like, yo, like that line on practice was amazing. I'm like, T tell me about that line on practice that, that I said. And they said, you said the best practice on purpose, the rest practice on prospects. And that is what a lot of salespeople do is they're practicing on prospects. They go through your training, they go through your session, and the manager goes, okay, now go do it. And the first time they're trying to do it is with the prospect, right? Like if you think about how long it takes to get good at something, right? Mm -hmm. What's, you know, the, the classic 10,000 hour rule, right? 10,000 mm -hmm. hours, which has been, you know, butchered a lot over, over the past decade or so, but like 10,000 hours of purposeful practice, not 10,000 hours of doing the thing. So let's do this real quick for a salesperson. If they run a demo a day, a demo a day, how long will it take for them to get 10,000 demos? Mm -hmm. A long okay. time. A long time. We're talking almost five years almost five years to get there. That's why most salespeople never get good at it because they're not even practicing. That's just doing 10,000 demos. So like when it comes to learning, right, to wrap on this, like, mm -hmm. yes, I have playbooks. Yes, I document. Yes, I blueprint a lot of things. But then we do a ton of repetition, practice and role plays and chunking sessions, speed work, like all sorts of things that we can do so they can retain it and recall it in the moment. Yeah, I, you know, I love that because, dude, I'm really enjoying talking to you, man. I, I, you're exceeding my expectations. I'm super happy right now. Uh, yeah, I'm super happy because I, I can tell you're well read, man. The, the, the interesting thing about retention, because I'm a big fan of, I looked at learning just like you did. And I, and I really started studying the art, not the art, the how memory works. 
because memory is recall, right? And, you know, I started thinking about how people, why are they afraid of certain things? Because of some past memories. I mean, they're still tapping into that. And recall is part of tapping into past memories. And what I love about what you said is, one, the 10,000-hour rule, which is it came out with Malcolm Gladwell, I think, did the tipping point or something like that. And people just, you know. Uh, but it's perf- purposeful practice. You don't need the 10,000 hours. It's just how you practice. But you said something, you just kind of threw it in there real low-key, like no big deal. But it's like you also talked about chunking. You know, and I love people who understand that because learning is about chunking things down so they're, I guess, more palatable and acceptable and retainable so that you could use it during your presentation. So talk to me about your process when you're trying to get people to learn, you know, new strategies, you know, because I rarely have an opportunity to really dig into Hell learning, yeah. man, so Let's I'm go. enjoying Let's this. Go. So it's actually funny. There's a conversation I had with um, my head of sales enablement and training a couple of weeks ago. I was like, how's the new group doing? And his response would probably blow a lot of people's mind. He's like, you know what? We did a, they, they nailed the first line today. They nailed the first line today, right? And tr- I, trust me when I say a lot of VPs would be like, you only covered the first line? Like just the first line of the script? Like we need them on the phones in three days. No, you don't need them on the phone in three days. They spent a day on the opening three lines of the script, right? And they're repetition, 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 repetition over and over and over again, right? To the point of now, like they have it, they know it in a day versus they did it for an hour, then they go to the next part of the script and the next part of the script. So like we chunk our trainings, we chunk our role plays. I don't remember the last time I role played an entire call with a rep or an entire demo with a rep. What's the area we're trying to work on? This, right? That's, that's it, right? So if you have a rep out there, anyone that's listening, they're struggling with an objection. Practice that objection for 30 minutes and watch how quickly they never forget it. So, so Victor, what is it you do, right? The, the objection, no one talks about as an objection, but the what do you do? What do you do? Oh, well, you know, I, I, okay, we gotta, let's catch that again. There's no, I, I. what do you do? This, okay, so what do you do? this okay what do you like it gets to a point where you actually want them like yo i got it oh do you now what do you do right it's it it has to get almost to an eye roll situation where they are rolling their eyes at you of like yo i've got this let's move on until then they don't actually have it i call it the 2 a.m test i should be able to hit you up saturday morning two o'clock in the morning, you who know you've been at the clubs. Who who knows how many Red Bull vodkas you've had that time? And I could say, "Hey, what's the value prop? What do we do?" And you could slur that stuff out because it's so ingrained in your head. So chunk it one piece at a time, high repetition, and come back to it. Right. So if you've talked about learning, like the forgetting curve, this was a big, big change even in my leadership. Is I was very um, sequential, A B C D E F G. All right, I'm gonna teach you each part of it as we move on. I was never coming back. And so also with learning, you need to teach it, you need to do it, give feedback, get away from it, then come back. So now it's like A, B, C, D, A, E, F, G, B, H, I, C, and we come back to it to make sure that we're always ingraining it. That, and that right there, my friend, that is true retention. And a lot of people don't understand that. You get it, man, because you have to learn it, put some time between, come back and touch it again. Then the neural pathways really begin to form. And a lot of people don't get that. And I love what you said about the uh, 2 a.m. I always said the 2.30 a.m. Because I was actually, uh, I was in a hotel, quick story, my wife, I'm sleeping. 2.30 a.m., I get a call. It says, is this Victor? I go, yeah. He goes, uh, we had an issue. I go, yeah. And I was supposed to do a workshop. He goes, uh, we lost our keynote speaker, giving you the short version. Can you do a keynote tomorrow? We got like two, 3,000 people. Are you ready for a keynote? I said, yeah, okay. He goes, are you sure? I go, yeah, I'll do it. And so what time do you want me to do it? 7 o'clock. And I remember hanging up the phone, still coming out of my fog. And my wife said, what was that? Somebody wants me to do a keynote you know, in about five, six hours. He says, you ready? I go, yeah, I think so. Literally went and took a shower, fell back asleep, woke up again, went downstairs, nailed it, killed it. And how do I know I killed it? They doubled my fee. Because yeah, of a last minute yeah. thing, Be- because you know your stuff. And but what I love about what you're saying is that this works at all levels, not just at a big stage level. It works at that level where you're just trying to get the first two or three lines. Katie, last night's uh, Sales After Dark uh, live stream was about 
the intro, the cadences, the pauses, the emphasis, the inflection on just two or three lines, man. Dude, you, we're lining up like this. And, I, and I so, love it. And I love the fact that you're mentioning learning and retention and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so, but hey, man, I, I can't I can't get off this conversation. Dude, not, not without going through your list here a little bit, okay? Because okay. I, I got to share I, I got to share this list. Hold on, I got to pull it up. All right. So this is, by the way, I mean, really, uh, Kevin Dorsey, just check, just go on LinkedIn. Just check out his posts. And first of all, I like the way you write them out because they're very easy to read. And again, I'm going to use the word, they're not pretentious with you. I mean, you're just, you just write, and I can feel that you're being honest and not trying to impress anybody. All right, mm -hmm. Kevin, do you have the list in front of you, by the way? Do you have your list? No. no. <laughs> all right, I, I got it for you. All right. <clears throat> so, Kevin. Yeah. Sales fails. Let's go through Kevin's. It's almost like a Letterman thing, a top 10 sales fails. Uh, the first one here, almost got arrested while trying to get into a school to get a principal to sign a contract. Tell us about that, Kevin. Uh, yes. So I was um, trying. So this was when I was selling um, healthy, healthy vending machines for a franchise at, at Humans, who were the number one healthy vending franchise in the country. I had a franchisee in Calabasas, California, and I was trying to close this school district. Right. And if you can get into a school district for like healthy vending machines, one of the best places like to be. Right. I had every other school signed on except for this school. And I just needed her to sign the contract. Summer break comes. So now there's no receptionist, there's no one in the school, no one's answering the phone. I cannot get this woman on the phone to sign the contract. And I keep telling my franchisee, like, yo, like, I need you to go to the school. I need you to go there. He's like, no, I was like, fine, I'll go. All right, so I drive myself up there, get into the parking lot, and I can see her car. Principal Ortega is at the school. You know how I know she's at the school? Because she's parked in the principal's parking spot at the school. So I am trying to, like, I call, of course, no one answers. I knock on the door, no one opens. So now, now in retrospect, everybody, I understand how sketchy this looked. But in the moment, I was in sales mode. I was trying to get my contract signed. Yeah. But here we are at a, pretty much an empty school with a black man walking around the campus, poking his head in windows and shit, <laughs> trying to, like, test the doors. I'm like, how did I not get arrested? So I can't get into the school, so I go back to my car, and literally I'm just sitting there waiting, which again, in retrospect, really, really sketchy. I'm just sitting there waiting next to the principal's car. All the wrong, <laughs> you're sending all the wrong signals, man. Just everything like, is just wrong. <laughs> Even just telling this story, I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? But then, so I'm sitting in the car, right? I'm like, all right, like, what am I going to do next? And I get that rat, tat, tat, tat on the window, and I look over, and there's a police officer there, like, hey, like, you know, <laughs> we, we got a call about a suspicious male, <laughs> like, uh, around the school. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> who, is it? who is it? Who is it? Who is this? Like, I'm going to need you to ask you to leave the campus, sir. And I was like, oh, that's, that is me. Damn it. So yeah, so that was that was that one. And um eventually I answered eventually I got the contract signed, but I done like man, I was just, what the hell was I thinking? Like I don't uh, know, setting up all there was no self awareness going on at that no. point. You were in sales mode. You're like, I want oh, to get the deal, man. I'm getting this contract and thank You're goodness I didn't funny. get arrested. Let me see. There was another one here that was just really funny. Uh on, which is the one you called it well, I, I by the way, I've called a prospect the wrong name for an entire presentation. You know, and then they correct you at the end. You're like, all right, right. Like, how do you let me go the whole time? Like, just tell me I'm wrong. But how do I go through the whole presentation? Like, not even close. It wasn't even like John and Jim. It was like his name was John and I was calling him Steven. You know, like it wasn't even close for a whole presentation at the very end. Uh, by the way, my name is Steven. I'm like, John, yeah. damn it. Yeah, huh. I, ca I caught mine because halfway through the presentation, there was like these smirks that would appear every time I'd say his name. And you go, mm. why, why, why are they smirking? And then it just hit me. Okay, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I love the fact that you added an extra zero to a $1.2 million contract, turning it into a $12 million order. I mean, if you want to raise your sales numbers, that's how you do it, man. And you almost lost the whole thing, and you don't know why. Hit me with that one. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, I was selling um, fitness equipment to, like, hotels and hospitals and gyms. I kind of uh, made the enterprise team there, and it was a $1.2 million, like, you know, gym set up for a big hotel. And like everything's good, right? Like the whole sales process, we're good, we're signed off, dotted, everything's good. He's like, send, send the contract, I'll sign it tonight. I'm like, cool. So, of course, again, salesperson, like happiness, right? Like, go and draft up the contract, 1.2, send it out. And, you know, I said, like, hey, I just sent it, 
Let me know when it's in. Can't wait to get you started. I don't hear anything back. Next day, don't hear anything back. Two days ago, I'm like, yo, like, hey, what, what's happening? He's not picking up my phone calls. He's not responding to emails, like nothing. So like, I, I wasn't thinking that something had gone wrong with the contract. Like, just all of a sudden, just ghosted, right? And I'm not hearing from anyone. I'm like, what is going on? So I resend the contract, right? I'm like, hey, like maybe it just didn't come through. Like, here you go. Finally, he answers the phone. This is after like three weeks of just like nothing. He's like, you know, hey, you know, sorry, like we're just not able to move forward. Like, just don't feel good about how the terms changed at the last minute. And like integrity means a lot to us. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, what, what are you talking about? Because like, integrity means everything to me as a salesperson, you know? Like, I would never want to like mislead someone or go whatever. He's like, well, and we went through this whole process and you sent us a $12 million contract after I had told him it was gonna be $1.2 million. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, look at the contract. Sure enough, $12 million contract is what I sent over. And like, and I did, like, if I hadn't gotten in touch with him, I never would have known because I never thought to check if I had messed up the contract. But like he did, like, and he thought I was, you know, had pulled the wool over his eyes or something in some way and like actually had done it. So luckily I still closed that deal. But yeah, that was a... That was a whoops today. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like the way you actually had to follow up. You know how some salespeople just kind of give up because they feel they've been ghosted. You know, they're like, and they start kind of inventing things in their head. Well, you know what? Mm-hmm. They weren't really serious about the deal. And you're like, no, I need to right. find out why. And yeah. I love that. I didn't ask you this, Kevin. And it's a good question to ask. I should have asked it earlier. And I apologize. It's like, how did you get in? Like, what you, I mean, I, you didn't just jump into sales. You know, what was the, what were you doing before you got into sales? And what was that moment when you said, you know what? I think I might want to do this. So I don't know if I ever had that moment, to be honest. Um, I was a senior in college. I was in a major that I knew I wasn't going to actually pursue anymore. So I was studying kinesiology. Um, so I thought at first I wanted to go into sports medicine. I was like, wait, that's going to be eight more years of school. Mm-hmm. Hell no. Oh, maybe I'll do physical therapy instead. Oh, wait, another three years of school. And like, I wouldn't actually get to do the type of work that I wanted to do. So I was actually in a little bit of a freak out, right? I'm like, what am I going to do with my, my life, you know? And I chose to get into sales be, and I tell people the story and they're like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. I said, I chose sales because I thought sales was the most secure job I could have. And not, not secure because like there's not turnover or anything like that. Secure because they're always hiring salespeople. So in my head, I was like, no matter what, I'll have a job. Like, no matter what, I'll have a job. Dude, I, love, hard. I love that perspective. Because I, I always tell people, if you know how to sell, you'll always have a job. Right. And I was, at, at that point in my life, I was actually looking the other way. I was like, even if I don't know how to sell, like, there's always <laughs> jobs out there. Like, someone will hire me and give me a shot, right? And so I started, I started selling knockoff Cutco knives in college. Not the real Cutco <laughs> knives, like knockoff <laughs> Cutco knives. Um, again, like my decision making as a young man was far from far from yeah. ideal. That didn't go very well. Um, I got into like multi level marketing for a little bit. I sold like insurance, XM radios. Like I was dabbling into all the things. Um, and then when I moved back out to um, Los Angeles, that's when I got my first mentor, and he's who I would say got me actually into sales you know like doing it intentionally like that's when i started reading the zig ziglers and the brian tracy's right like really starting to get into oh i can learn how to do this mm-hmm. like i don't i don't have to flail away for years and get lucky like there's actually people teaching how to do this and that that's what blew my mind right is like wow why take 20 years to get good at something if i can learn from someone who did it for 20 years it seems like a lot faster way to be successful. Mm-hmm. And so that that was when it really started to click for me. I was selling on personal training at the time. And so that's also, you know, you opened up with this, the why people buy. Mm-hmm. That was my first real lesson in why-based selling. No one wants to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Why do they want to lose weight? Right. Right. They've got a wedding coming up. They've got a reunion coming up. They can't play with their kids. But then you go another layer deeper. Well, why does that matter to you? Mm. Now you're selling, right? Now it's not about the weight loss. Now it's not about anything else. So that was my introduction to why-based selling. And I've I love that. run with that ever, ever since. So like that's, that's kind of like my story into sales. 
I love it. I love it. When you're dealing with new salespeople, I want you to direct this comment towards salespeople who, you know, maybe one day want to be in your position, want to be VP of sales, inside sales. You know, you know, what do they have to start doing, man? I, I know you've gone through a lot of it already, but give just just repeat the roadmap. Like these are the things you need to hit. And stop being lazy. Hit these things. Do these things. Be consistent. You know, what are some of the things that they need to do? Yeah. I'd say learn, practice, Break. do. Right? So most let's let's just be real. Let's I just, just, I just real. love that. I just like learn, practice, do. Bam, we're done. Can I just walk off okay. the mic right, right now? <laughs> right, right behind you right now. I don't know if people are gonna get to see this video, but behind you right now, mm -hmm. I can see three books behind you. Right. The right. average salesperson has read less than three books in their career like that's just a travesty it's actually just an insult to our entire profession that we don't take this shit seriously like mm -hmm. most people put in 10 times as much effort into their high school sport or band or instrument than they do to their sales career so the first place is learn there the information's out there there's people like you and me and books and courses out there giving like giving this to you Right. Like, so learn, learn what it means to be a salesperson, learn how people make decisions, learn how people make choices, learn what motivates people, right? Like learn there first, then you got to practice it, like actually intentionally practice this, find a mentor, find a friend and practice it. So when you're walking into that prospect's office or you're on the phone with that prospect and salespeople, we've all been there. I know what it feels like to make $200 in a row. No one answers and all of a sudden. Victor answers and you're like, oh, uh, uh, hey, oh, hey, how's it, how's it going? And they're like, who is this? Oh, it's um, Kevin. I'm calling from your local. It, you, you, you missed it. That was yep. your shot. And you weren't ready because you hadn't been practicing, right? But then the last part of this is do. And to this is to wrap on to get to my level, then obviously then to your level is start doing the job that you want next before you have it, right? People have growth very confused. You outgrow your position. You're not given growth. You follow me here? Like I if love you that. want to be you want to be a manager, you need to outgrow being a sales rep. Right? You don't wait to be a manager to now start to grow as a manager, right? Like if you want to be a manager, start reading management books while you're a rep. You're a manager and you want to be a director, start reaching out to directors for mentorship when you're a manager, right? Like you start doing the job beforehand. Every promotion that I've had in my life has been very disappointingly anticlimactic. You know why? Because it surprised nobody. By the time I was promoted to manager, it was like a, what has he been doing? Like, right. He, right. he is the manager. When Dude, I, I, got my I, first, I, I love that you know, perspective like, about outgrowing your position, man. I love that perspective. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's where people miss it. They wait for growth to be given to them. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when I see salespeople, uh, one of my most popular videos is just a rant, just a total rant about how people are waiting for companies to train them, which is to your point. No, take responsibility for your own training. I would say salespeople are like a walking P&L, a little business unit. If you treat it like that, as you say, you'll always have a job. But I, but I, I love the, 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 I think the learn, practice, and do it. I think the practice piece is the part where I think a lot of people fail. They just simply don't practice it and get it to a point where you said it's like beyond rote. I mean, you just know it. But it doesn't come out automatically. It also has that, I think you touched on, and I think you're hitting it early on when you talk about the emotional piece. Hmm. You, know, it, you have to feel that. People have to know that you want to help them. When we talk about yes. take their point of view, really try to help them and you get away from selling and you you get towards helping and i think that that's always a good transition kevin close me out with that matt give, give me some final thoughts on helping serving all that good stuff so the you know you brought up call reluctance earlier in the call and i think this is a good thing we can wrap on here the only time that you have call reluctance is because you're thinking of yourself not of the prospect you're Dude, worried about you're how heavy, man. You're, you're, you're so heavy, okay. brother, man. You're a heavy right. brother, man. I love it. Okay. I love it. You're thinking about how you're going to look, how right. you're going to sound, how you're going to fail, how you, it's all focused on you. That's where the fear comes in. If you can change that perspective to your prospect, if you can picture them struggling with the problem that you solve, if you can picture them 
frustrated over not being able to figure something out, if you can picture them dealing with the day in and day out struggles of their world, full circle to intention. What's your intention on that call? To help them with that. But if your intention on the call is to set a meeting, that's where the reluctance comes in because now you're in your head of like, well, I've made this call before and they said no, or I've made this call before and I've been rejected and now you're in yourself versus this prospect is struggling with something I can fix. I don't care if they've told me no before. They're still struggling with the thing that I fix and my intention is to help them with that. Right. So like I I take my teams through this exercise. I've written about this before. Take two to three deep breaths and picture your prospect struggling. Picture them dealing with that problem. And if you can do that, picking up that phone, I'm not going to say the phone still isn't going to weigh 100 pounds, but it might only weigh 50 pounds to pick it up now because you're thinking of them. And then that does come across in your tone. Right. When you're like, hey. You know, Miss Prospect, it's Kevin over at Patient Pop. You know, you just popped into my head, and I was hoping to ask you just a couple quick questions here. Like, do you got a second for me? That tone alone, like, I mean, okay. Yeah. And then you say, hey, look, like, you may not struggle with this, but a lot of the VPs I'm talking to are struggling with X, Y, or Z. Like, does that sound like your world, or do you have it all figured out already? Mm-hmm. Like, nice. you, you can you can bring that tone across, and then it's like, hey, like, you know, I, I could help maybe with that. Only if you're open to it. If you're fine with that problem, that's fine. But if you're open to maybe learning how to solve this, like, I'd love to be able to help you with that. Could we find yeah. some time to do it? Like, so it comes to intention and tone. Think of your prospect. Think of them having that struggle. Let that help come through your tone. But then ask to help. Ask to help. And you'll be shocked at how many more people are open to that versus, you got 45 minutes for a product demo that I can show you? My <laughs> God. So, Kevin, man, I got to tell you, I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm, I'm going to give you my, my, my thoughts, the ones that, that I really love and what you say, because uh, this is one of those interviews I really love staying quiet for. You know what I mean? Because you're just going, I think the learn, practice, do is big. I think the you outgrow your position, a brilliant uh, practice on the process, not the prospect. Obvious one. The intentional being the biggest piece. But this last one, I think you really nailed it, because I always tell people, you don't have to love what you sell, but you should love what you, it does for your customer. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I got to jump in there because oh, that, that sure. fires me up to hear it because people will say you have to be passionate about your product. I'm like, no, you don't. You have to be passionate about your prospect. You don't have to be passionate about your product, right? Can it help? Maybe, but sometimes that's when you talk too much about the product. Mm-hmm. But if you're passionate about your prospect, if you're passionate about the process, that's that's the game changer. So like, I'm just glad you said that because everyone always says it's you know you gotta have sell a product you believe in. Like, mm-hmm. Yes. I'm, I'm the other way. I'm like, as long as you're just not selling a product that you don't believe in. And the well, only reason you would sell a product you don't believe in is if you don't care about the prospect. There you go. There you go. And, and I always tell people, you've got to believe that it will help the prospect. Do you believe this product will help the prospect? If the answer is yes, you got it. Then you can sell it with that serving attitude. Katie, this has been a true pleasure, man. Like I said, uh, you've raised the bar on the Sales Influence Podcast. Oh. For anybody who comes yeah. after you, they better just, you know, they gotta, they gotta level up, man. Katie, where can they find out more information about you, brother? Uh, definitely on on LinkedIn, you can, can find me there. I don't have like the other stuff, Twitter, Snap, Gram, TikTok, wherever the kids are hanging out. I have LinkedIn, that's it. Um, I have a Patreon group where I do like more like in-depth trainings, you know, like LinkedIn's cool for ideas and thoughts, but I have a Patreon group called Inside Sales Excellence where like I do live trainings, live coaching, things like that, just to give a little bit more. Um, but that's it, man. You know, I'm out here, I'm doing my best. I'm learning and sharing what I learn as I go and hopefully can have an impact on people when they hear it. Well, man, stay positive on the post. Like I said, I really like them. Kevin Dorsey, check him out on LinkedIn. And that's it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you find me. Also, when you get a chance, check out the Sales Velocity Academy. 50 courses, 500 videos. If you want to get better, faster, check out the salesvelocityacademy.com. And final words, selling ain't hard, according to Kevin, my man, if you know how. Take care.